everybody for coming. So let's get, get started with session one. Um, our first speaker is El Presto. Um, El Presto is an associate uh, research professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University and a member of the Center for um, uh, Atmospheric Particle Studies. Um, so his research focuses on pollution uh, emissions from energy extraction and consumption and the subsequent atmospherical transformations that these uh, transmissions undergo, uh, these emissions undergo. He also works closely with community groups to share air quality data directly with the public. So, um, so Al, uh, feel free to share your slides. And I wanted a, a little overview of the format. We have uh, each we have spe uh, three speakers of the session. They will each talk about um, uh, 15 minutes, and then we will invite them back to uh, have a panel discussion. So at e uh, at the end of the each talk, I invite our audience to ask your questions. In fact, um, I encourage you to type your questions in, send the, your questions through chat uh, during the talks already. Um, and then uh, for more in-depth questions, we can save till the panel discussion. So I, I can see your slide. Yeah, and you can see them? Yeah. Okay, and I, okay. Need, I always need to check. You can see the slides and not the presenter view, right? Yes. Great, okay. Um, thanks for the talk this morning. I'm going to talk about uh, how we approach open data in, in this uh, center that we have that's called the Center for Air, Climate and Energy Solutions or CASES. Um, and CASES is, is a, basically a big project that's funded by the US EPA. Um, and so it is important to be able to sort of share data within CASES because CASES itself is a big con collaborative project. It's multi-institution international product or project, excuse me. Um, that the leads right now sit at Carnegie Mellon, which is where I am, and the University of Washington. But we also have collaborators at uh, all of these places listed on here, BYU, Texas, Minnesota, Virginia Tech, Imperial College London, and, and Health Canada. So this is a big sort of group of people working on this, and we need to be able to sort of communicate both internally and externally uh, in, in a way that, that is efficient. And so what we do in cases, because I figure most of you are not familiar with it, uh, is again, this is a this is a basically a big project that has to do with with air pollution health and air pollution policy. So we have sort of four major goals. Um, one is to measure air pollutant concentrations in in different places across the country uh, to understand how that impacts various communities and vulnerable populations. That's the part of the work that I'm most involved in. Uh, a second goal is to develop uh, tools for scientists, policymakers, and citizens to basically understand air pollution sort of, you know, at a national level down to a local level um, and to be able to sort of put costs to that. So to be able to assess sort of social costs and, and, and future policy impacts. Uh, some of those future policy impacts we're evaluating within cases, right? And so you can imagine different scenarios for how we treat vehicles or how we treat electricity generation. Um, and so we're evaluating some of those policies within cases. Uh, one of the big focus areas is actually food production and how that impacts air pollution. Uh, and then lastly, we, we want to get at health. So we have epidemiologists on the team. Um, and so understanding how sort of what are current health effects and what would be the health effects, potential health effects under these future policy scenarios. And so to meet those four outcomes, we're organized into five different projects. And I'm not going to go into super great detail on the projects. Uh, but basically two of the projects, project one and project three, are both about model building. And so we're building different types of air quality models. Uh, we're connecting those models to project two, which are the, these field measurements. So we're actually measuring uh, air pollutant concentrations in different cities and tying those back to those models. Those models feed into project four, which is this policy scenario application. And those models also feed into project five, which is the, which is the epidemiology. Uh, one way that we often sort of show this is this diagram that we call the Starship Enterprise sort of, you know, and so all of the arrows here are showing the connections between the projects. And the point here is that 
you know, there's a lot of interconnectivity, right? Project two, which is the measurements, really has to communicate to projects one and three. Projects one and three in turn have to talk to projects four and five. And so all of that conversation has to happen sort of within CMU and across all of these different institutions. Um, and so it's important to be able to sort of do that communication in a, in a way that, that is beneficial, right? So that we're not bogged down. Uh, we're also, in cases, building a, a pretty diverse toolkit. And so out of each of these projects, we have tools that we want other people to be able to use. So for example, in project one, we're building mechanistic models. So these are models that represent all of the physics and chemistry that are happening in the atmosphere. But we have those at sort of the high level of detail and also what are called reduced complexity models, sort of a lower level of detail. And we want to be able to use those within cases, but also people external to cases. We want them to be able to use those models as well. Similarly, the models in project three, we want to be able to have people use, and we want people to have access to these measurements that we're doing in project two. Uh, and so when we think about uh, how we need to share data and results, we really have sort of three audiences, right? One is within cases, then we need to talk across all of those, those arrows that I showed a few slides ago. Uh, one is we need to be able to communicate our results and share our results with academic and government colleagues, right? So this is funded by the EPA and the EPA is interested in the results and there are researchers at EPA who want to be able to use the tools we're generating. Similarly, people at other schools want to use the outputs, maybe not get into the, into the weeds. Uh, and then also with the broader public. And I'll show some examples from both cases in my own work about sort of linking and, and sharing data uh, more broadly with, with the, the lay public. And there are a couple drivers for, you know, how we're approaching open. Is that, you know, there is pressure from both government and journals to make data more available. It's no longer sort of appropriate or really, maybe the people let you slide, but it's no longer really acceptable to just put at the end of the journal article, oh, email us if you want the data, right? Journals and, and, and the funders want to see the data sort of published somewhere and more accessible than that. Uh, and a lot of lay people do want access to data, right? People are buying little air quality monitors and they want to be able to access that data. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that. So one example of that is, is something called the RAMP. So the RAMP is, stands for Real-Time Affordable Multi-Pollutant Sensor Package. Um, and that's what's shown in the photograph here. And so the RAMP is a low cost air pollutant uh, sensor package that we've developed at CMU in collaboration with the company uh, that used to be called Sensevere that, that, that spun out of CMU. And what we've done since 2016 is maintain a network of these ramps. And so the, the map just shows, uh, this is Pittsburgh. We at, at our height had sort of 50 ramps uh, around Pittsburgh and, and some of the suburbs. It's since shrunk a little bit, but we've maintained this network for, for the better part of four and a half years now. And so a lot of these ramps are located at people's homes. So you may be able to see that this is actually a ramp on someone's porch, right? That red beam is, is, is a support beam for someone's porch. Some of them are at schools, some are at businesses. It's very much a, you know, getting these out is very much a retail sort of enterprise. And often the people who host them want the data, they, they're hosting it because they're interested in this information. And so we, we, we share the ramp data in a few different ways. Uh, one is we've, we've come up with a report uh, and the report has a set of figures in it that we've sort of honed in on by working with people in social decision sciences at CMU and also with talking with with the various hosts to get a sense of what they want to see. And so we have a report and, and today or tomorrow we're going to roll out, we're going to put sort of publicly a whole network report that we will update monthly. Um, so we have that's one data product that we share. Uh, another is for a while we've been running a, a real time map that you know, rather than having a map with a bunch of dots on it, this interpolates between all of these locations where the ramps are in sort of real time. And then if you see the yellow box here, you can click around the map and, and get a sense of what the pollutant concentrations are. They're indicated by the, the color scale here. So darker reds are higher concentration. As you click to different places, the speedometer at the top sort of moves to, to, to the right position. You know, so you have sort of multiple ways of, of interpreting this data, right? And this is good for someone who maybe wants to just get a sense of like, what is the air pollution in my neighborhood right now? Is it sort of good versus bad? This is one way to get at that. Uh, and this is definitely something EPA was really interested in is, you know, how do you do this sort of communication to communities? And this is one resource that we've, we've built towards that end. 
uh, for the sort of more hardcore users, we do make the raw data available as well. Um, and so the Create Lab at CMU, down here at this URL, they have something called the Environmental Sciences Data Repository, or ESDR, E-S-D-R. And ESDR mirrors a bunch of different sort of freely available air pollutant data sources. We include the ramps in that. Um, and that allows you to zoom in. So if you go to this, this URL, and up in the search box in the top left, if you type in ramp, you get where all the ramps are or ha have ever been. And then you can click around and see what data is available. So I've clicked on this one that's in, in downtown Pittsburgh. You know, it shows the various pollutants that are available. You know, I can, the one that has the check mark um, then plots the, the data up to the second, right? So we update this data set every 15 minutes. Um, and so when I pulled this data down, this was in July, you know, it showed up to that 15 minute period and you can sort of get a sense of what the data are in real time. Uh, you can also download the data from here. So there's an export data button so people can download the data and then look at it on their own offline if they like. Um, I would say, I think I am the number one user of this because if I want to quickly look at data from the ramps, I will go to here instead of emailing my technician to pull it off of our server. But um, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of citizens are interested uh, in, in having, um, having the data sort of available at their fingertips, but then they go to this and maybe it's a little bit intimidating. But we do, it is something we do make available um, if, if people want to use it. So those are sort of examples of sharing more with a lay public. Uh, for sharing within the scientific community, we've done a lot with, uh, or we've done a, a shared a few data sets with Killtub which is this open data repository that's available through the CMU libraries. And they've been a really huge help in, in helping us get this up and running. Um, so here's just one example. So this is the raw measurement data that we collected as part of cases. Um, and and KillHub is great because you know, there's a DOI associated with this. So in the paper, we could just put, you know, here's the DOI with the data. We can do updates. So you can see here that this is sort of revision one of this data set. Um, and it really helps me. Because rather than, you know, someone emailing me five years after the paper is published and saying, hey, you know, where is that data? You know, this, this data set was put up by Peishi Gu, whose name is right there. Uh, you know, before he left, when he finished his thesis, I said, hey, I need you to get this data set. And so we can put it up online. And then, you know, down the road, it's sort of archived, right? And we don't have to, I don't have to worry about someone coming in a few years and then me hunting him down. Um, or hoping that I can find the files on my computer, which is, is probably a hopeless cause. Um, and so we've done that. Uh, we've also published data analysis to tutorials. This is for the low cost sensor data. So we've, we've written a few papers on how to treat data from the sensors and how to uh, and how to calibrate them. And so Carl Malings, who, is a, who was a postdoc with us here at CMU, put up on Zenodo, which is sort of an open access uh, data repository, these tutorials and he did a really great job. There are videos that go with them. There are data sets that people can download. And then this is a resource that we can use. So going forward, we have a project where we're going to be sort of doing uh, sensor deployment and training in, in Africa, and we'll use this resource. Uh, then lastly, uh, I talked about cases. We're building these various models. If you go to the cases website, which is cases.us, you can actually download the outputs from those models. So these reduced form models and then these statistical models that have been built as part of cases are available. And you can go and you know, we have a lot of detail there. You can download the models you know, at, at sort of a state level or a national level or even at the census block level. You can do it for different years. And all we really ask is, is for people's email addresses so that we know that we're not getting sort of, you know, so that we have some sense of whether people are from academia or, or government or, or private people. Um, and to date, we've had sort of 1,500 unique downloads, which I think is, 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 is pretty successful. So then just lastly, real quick, uh, my closing thoughts. Uh, I do want to point out, I, you know, I'd be interested to hear through the course of this ways to sort of make getting the data online a little bit more streamlined. It, you know, I'm really glad that we've done it, but it does take a concerted effort, right? Getting, hunting my student down and making sure we get things up on KillHub before he graduates does take some time. Doing the metadata takes some time. Um, and obviously, you know, we're in a pretty niche market here. You know, I'm not expecting 100,000 visitors a day. Um, you know, you know, we're we're putting in this effort for sort of a, a pretty small small population, but I think there's a lot of value in, in doing it nonetheless. Um, so I'll end there. Um, 
And I guess I should uh, unshare at this point, right? Oh, that's after you can, oh, yeah, right, yeah. I guess uh, while we have questions coming in, we can have the next speaker set up. Um, so audience, do you uh, have any questions for Al? So, um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with a question. Al, it's really fascinating work to see like your uh, pulling all these data sources together and share with all these different uh, stakeholders, um, huge amount of work. Um, so as uh, from your talk, it seems like you're sharing your resources at the different places, your dashboard, the code hub and use mm -hmm. Inodo. Do you have a consolidated like view of how much the data is used overall in all different platforms? No, I don't. Um, you no, know, the only place where we're really tracking sort of use is on the cases.us website. Um, okay. Everywhere else we don't have sort of active tracking going on. Um, so it's more by like word of mouth, people telling me that they, they happen to download it. Um, okay, yeah. The, the reason I ask is that often uh, I, I see the uh, same problem with many researchers sharing their resources and don't have a really good way of um, tracking the usage. Um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, people doing the same work might have the, the same uh, issue with. So that. I think I think Kilt Hub like logs how many views and downloads there are, um, yeah. but I'm not doing anything to sort of keep track of that. So unless I happen to log in and check, you know, I'm not cataloging that anywhere. Right. Sounds good. Fair enough. Um, so, is there any uh, question from the audience? We have a manageable size of um, audience. So if you would like to speak up, feel free to raise your hands and unmute yourself. All right, so, oh, sorry, that was. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess now, uh, thank you, Al. Uh, we'll uh, invite you back for the panel discussion. All right now, let's move on to the next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Varsha Akodier. Uh, sorry, I might not be pronouncing the last name correctly, you but uh, Dr. Perfectly. Varsha. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, she has uh, nearly two decades of experience as a research data curator, having worked as a curator for the Human Genome Project and the Gene Ontology Project. Varsha's publishing center began with a short stint at F1000 Research, followed by over five years as an editor for the Nature Research Journal, um, a data science, uh, scientific data, sorry. Varsha leads the team of data experts um, delivering Springer Nature Research Data Support Service and also contributes to the design development and delivery of the Nature Research Academic, uh, Academy data training workshops. Um, she curates and maintains the Springer Nature recommended repository list and is an ex executive advisor of fairsharing.org, a member of the Code Data International Data Policy Committee and uh, uh, program chair for the Better Research Through Better Data Conference series. Varsha, um, good to see you here. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Can I just check? Um, can you? Can, is is my screen being shared? Yes. You can see my slides. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to present, um, and I'm really pleased I could uh, finally make it. Uh, although not to Pittsburgh in person, but I'm really pleased to be here. So um, I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about the kinds of things that we're doing uh, with regard to. Uh, data stewardship and data curation um, as part of the publication process. So let me just see if I can make my slides move on. There we go. So this is uh, uh, this is a graphic that was produced. I would hands up. I didn't produce this, but it's a very useful graphic that was produced by uh, my colleagues at Springer Nature, and um, it just really en encompasses why why we think open science is important and why sharing research data is important. 
Um, and we try and think of it in three different buckets, if you like. First of all, let's take the benefits for the individual researcher. There's, um, if you share your research data, you're building your, your reputation as someone who understands what they're doing because you're sharing your data. People can um, look at your data sets. They can have those proper scientific, um, robust interactions with you. And you're basically saying you have faith in what you're producing as a scientist because you're, you're open to sharing your data and you're asking people to you know, assess the work. And that's exactly what we do in science. We want to make sure that we replicate each other's work. So then the sum of what we know to be true can be um, agreed by more than one lab. That's the ideal. Um, we know, for example, that um, there's a recent study that came out um, earlier this year uh, showing that data pap papers, research papers with clear links to the underlying data sets that have been shared in a repository seem to have an uplift of 25% in terms of citations. Um, and they looked at almost, I think, just over half a million papers. This was a really big study. And it's quite a significant research, uh, result showing that sharing your data, you are making your work easier to use. Presumably, that's what we'd see the citations. The next group that we think about is the research community as a whole. So if you're able to interrogate each other's work, check that it's valid, replicate results, that's really useful. But also thinking about, you know, reducing the need for un, un, experiments that have already been carried out by your colleagues or by your collaborators elsewhere. Um, as we saw with um, Al's excellent talk just previously, sharing that data, sharing those resources, then enable training of undergraduates of um, in or you know, researchers in other countries. I think that's a really important thing to bear in mind. And then we think about that third bucket, which is the benefit to the wider society. So bearing, most, most researchers are either publicly funded or charitably funded. So we've got the lay public putting money in towards research. And so we would expect that research to have some benefit for that, for the public. Um, and we know uh, things, you know, we're in this very difficult situation in many places around the world where fact and opinion are quite often interchangeably used. And we need to make sure that we are sharing our research data so that the citizens of, of the world can actually interrogate that and make the help to make their own minds up and try to start separating fact from opinion and understand the benefit of the research process and the scientific process. Um, we want research data to inform um, public policy um, and that, that we also know that there are economic, ben economic benefits of sharing um, research data more widely. Um, I think the figure that's quoted for the um, data that was shared after the Human Genome Project is something like 15 billion over so many years uh, that we've seen an economic benefit for having those data sets shared. So in order to understand researchers' perspectives on, uh, on data, we, um, Spring and Nature carry out uh, surveys. They have carried out annual surveys over the last few years. Um, I should say all of these uh, data sets, all of the, um, the white papers that have been produced are openly available uh, on, the repository, on the Figshare repository. And uh, just to uh, also um, let you know that there'll be another State of Open Data coming out, the State of Open Data 2020 which will be released in, I think, the third week of November. So please do look out for that. But let's delve into what we see here. So looking back to um, over the last couple of years of data that we have, 2019 and 2018, uh, we asked researchers, which circumstances would motivate you to share your data? And this is what we found. The biggest um, reason that people uh, report as a motivation for sharing data is increase in the impact and visibility of their research. Second um, highest uh, response was for public benefit. And thirdly, uh, the most important thing for researchers was getting proper credit for sharing their data. Um, as again, as uh, Al mentioned um, just previously, the fourth is journal publisher requirement, uh, funder requirements. We can see further down the list. Um, absolutely, journals, publishers, funders are increasing, um, increasingly asking for research data to be shared for all of the reasons I just explained previously. We've also asked researchers, what makes you not want to share data? or What problems, concerns do you have with sharing data sets? And what we see is the biggest concern that researchers have had for both of these years running is concerns about misuse of data. Second to that um, is people being unsure about copyright and licensing. They don't necessarily know how to share their data, what license to apply to that data set. 
And you can see here another a really big concern is not, pre, not receiving appropriate credit or acknowledgement for having shared their data. Again, as Al just mentioned, it's, it's an effort to share data properly and to make sure it's understandable. Um, and there is, an, um, there is obviously, for very understandable reasons, a, a barrier when people think, well, if I'm putting all this effort in, what's going to be the benefit for me? Am I even going to be recognised for this? And I think there's still work to be done from institutions, for example, for recognising um, where researchers are sharing their data. But what can we as a publisher do? So we, um, obviously I'm speaking from uh, my viewpoint as Spring in Nature, um, one of the largest publishers um, working on scientific journals. So what can we do in terms of credit and visibility? So I'm sure uh, many of you are aware of there's such a thing as a data publication or a data journal or data paper. And I'd like to talk about two such journals uh, today. So the first being Scientific Data, which is a nature research journal. The data papers published in Scientific Data are called Data Descriptors, so that's the name of the format. And at Scientific Data, Data Descriptors are sent for peer review. We expect peer reviewers to look at the data as well, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Um, the scope of Scientific Data is sound science, so the research must be carried out well. There's no uh, requirement for novelty or perceived impact at the point of publication. It's based basically around sound science. But the important uh, thing at Scientific Data is there's an emphasis on data reuse. Um, and again, I'll talk about that in a few more minutes, but the, the data descriptor should make it easy for people to reuse the data set that is being described. The second journal I'd like to talk about today is BMC Research Notes, and they have a data paper format called the Data Note. This is intended and designed as a short format. Again, the focus is sound science, not perceived novelty or impact. And the emphasis is on data sharing. So to make it quick and easy for people to share their data and then to get that credit for both of these journals, to get that credit in the form of a citable peer reviewed paper. So just thinking about peer review at scientific data, what is it that we're looking for? What is it that peer reviewers are asked to do? And we can think of this in three distinct um, categories here. The first is experimental rigor and technical data quality. So reviewers are asked, were the data produced in a sound manner? Does it make sense in terms of the experiments that were conducted? Are the data looking like you would expect? What's the quality of the data like? For example, have they um, provided appropriate statistical analyses? And what's the experimental rigor? Have, is there an appropriate depth coverage? Have they used the right kind of controls that you would expect for the kind of experiment that, that they have described here? Secondly, we're asking reviewers to consider the completeness of the description. Have the authors um, provided enough detail to allow others to reproduce the steps or to reuse the data? And bearing in mind, reviewers are going to be looking not just at the information in the manuscript, they'll be also looking at the information that has been shared at the data repository where the data are held. And we ask reviewers to comment on whether the, the way that the data has been shared, if that's consistent with the minimum reporting standards that are relevant for that type of data set. So in some fields, there are very good minimal reporting standards and we expect data sets to adhere to those minimal reporting standards where available. And then thirdly, we ask reviewers to consider the integrity of the data files and the repository records. So do the data files appear complete and match the manuscript description? So if the manuscript mentions that this data set is on six patients, can you see at the repository uh, data relating to those six patients? To six, to, you know, <coughs> are there um, data from six people or are there data from five or seven? Does it all match? Does it make sense? And importantly, we also ask peer reviewers to consider whether data have been archived to the most appropriate repository for the type of data that they've shared. So again, in some fields, there are very clear community mandates and community norms which insist that data should be shared at a particular repository. An example is a genetic sequence should also always be shared at an IMSDC um, consortium repository. Just excuse me one minute. <coughs> so what else can we do as a publisher? Um, and as Hai Jin just mentioned, um, we do uh, provide some training and advice uh, to researchers. 
So one of the things we do is we run uh, the research data help desk and the email address is there on the screen. And this is run by myself and my colleagues in the research data team at Springer Nature. And between us, we have expertise in data curation and management in archiving, digital preservation, copyright licensing and open access publishing. And we can provide guidance and help with, with writing data availability statements and we have contextual examples across multiple disciplines. And we also um, maintain a recommended list of repositories. So the idea is that if you are wanting to share your data and you're not sure where you may share, where you can share those data, you can go to that repository list and get an indication of which repositories you might want to start looking at. The other important thing to bear in mind is we support uh, the use of community and discipline specific repositories over and above um, generalist repositories. We want data to be in a repository, but um, ideally data should be like with like. So we want genetic data, sequence data with other genetic sequence data, because it just makes it easier for data to be discovered and data to be used. <coughs> um, we run, we have developed a series of research data um, training workshops and modules, which we, um, which we deliver as part of the Nature Research Academies. And um, we can do this in person, but obviously this year, all of our in-person training has been over the web. Um, but we have developed a series of webinars, in-person training that we then help, we can then deliver to institutions, to fund it, funders, and help develop researchers' data sharing skills. And then we're also looking at ways in which we can help researchers to share their data at the point at which they're publishing their articles. So this is our um, service of research data support. Currently, um, our curators, our data stewards work on the two journals I mentioned previously, BMC Research Notes and Scientific Data, making sure that those manuscripts um, are consistent with what we see at the repository, making sure the data sets are shared accurately, making sure that the links to the data are um, accurate and consistent so that once the paper is published, people will actually be able to go through to the right data set. We've expanded this uh, out as a service, as research data support, to what we call um, the stewardship service. So again, that is looking at the whole manuscript, helping researchers to identify data sets that could be shared, that should be shared in some cases, and helping researchers to really make create very rich um, data availability statements. So we are working with um, three MPJ uh, breast cancer, uh, MPJ journals, I should say at the time. Uh, we just had another one start uh, last week, so I should have updated these slides. But um, working with the Hormel Institute on the uh, MPJ Precision Oncology, with the Breast Cancer Research Foundation um, on the Breast Cancer Journal, and also the RMIT University, uh, which is based in Melbourne, on the MPJ Urban Sustainability Journal. And we also have a partnership with Welcome, where we can provide research data support for all uh, Welcome funded researchers, no matter where they're publishing. So what do we do when we're looking at these papers? What does stewardship and curation actually look like at the publisher level? So potential outcomes of data stewardship, we might, um, we might find that there's information missing either in the manuscript or at the data repository, or we might find errors in either of those places and we would uh, indicate this to the authors. And the idea is that these errors and um, additional information can be added prior to the manuscript being published. The team also provides suggestions to increase the fairness of, um, of the data and apologies if you're not sure what uh, the acronym FAIR means, I'm happy to uh, talk more about that in the question session afterwards, but essentially FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And so we want to increase those four elements of a data set. And so we might comment, uh, we might provide suggestions, guidance on the repository metadata, uh, on the data access or the data licensing conditions that someone's used. Uh, an example of that might be people think, oh, there were, um, people might uh, be used to work in a clinical uh, environment and be aware that they can't necessarily share their data openly, move to uh, doing an experiment in mice and then just need reminding that actually but those mouse-based mouse experiments can be shared openly, there's, there's no uh, privacy considerations, things like that. Uh, we provide guidance on the manuscript, any element of the manuscript, the tables, text or figures, 
and also we can provide guidance on uh, making sure the data file names make sense, are comprehensible to people outside of that research group, or indeed how the data files are structured at the repository. So in terms of increasing visibility of research data, we can think about it uh, in two different aspects. So thinking simply, first of all, let's increase the visibility of research data for human readers. So we have a series of uh, four research data policies at Springer Nature. We were the first um, publisher to implement this level of um, data policy. And the idea is that we can encourage our journals to move from data type, data policy one, which is a simple, you know, you are allowed to uh, create a data available statement, you are allowed to mention research data, all the way to something like uh, data uh, policy type four, which is scientific data is an example of where data must be made available to, for peer review and data is expected to be peer reviewed. So what do we see? We see as a result of this kind of policy, as a result of the uh, data uh, research data support work, we see rich data availability statements, and this is just an example. We can see that there's very clear information about how the data were generated, where they can be found. And indeed, in some cases, some of these data sets are available on request, and some of the data sets are openly available. And we work with the authors to really make sure that the data available on request are available on request. There might be very good reasons for doing that, um, especially in clinical medicine uh, research. Uh, but where data can be shared openly, it is shared openly. And then we also make sure that uh, data sets are cited and properly uh, formally referenced in the references. So you can see in the example I have here, we have two data sets uh, referenced here, one uh, which is at the NCBI sequence reader archive and another which is at the Figshare repository. And you can see these are just numbered in line with the third reference, which is a reference to a, a, an article, a standard literature reference. And the idea of doing it this way is that we're saying that there is no difference in the terms of uh, citing data or citing articles. Both are equally important pieces and outputs of research. The other part of what we're trying to do is increase the visibility of research data to machines, because that is what's going to make it possible for data discovery to really uh, take off. So for the journal scientific data, we create machine accessible metadata for every data descriptor that is published. We make sure we use community endorsed ontologies and controlled vocabularies so that really to um, facilitate the machine readability and accessibility of these um, metadata. And we also participate in the Scolix project. So uh, this is uh, a, 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 a cross-publisher initiative intended to really, again, make it possible to bring out where data are mentioned in a research article and to make sure that the data are tagged in a way that makes it easy for machines to access, the, uh, to find those data sets. Um, I'm very happy to take questions and um, thank you for listening. Hey, uh... Yeah, thank you very much, Marsha. Thanks for that. Uh, it was fantastic. So we have a we do have a question for you from uh, Alex. Um, so the question is, uh, did you uh, when you did the survey, did you break down uh, by clinical versus non clinical researchers? Because um, in her experience, non clinical researchers are much more interested in data sharing. Um, yeah, so we have, so the surveys are very broad ranging across all disciplines and if you delve into the data, there's definitely demographic information within that, absolutely. So, um, which will include things like geographical location, um, career stages, as well as what discipline a, a researcher is working with, and there's some very interesting insights in there, absolutely. All right, thank you very much. For the sake of time, uh, we can save more questions until the panel uh, now, yeah, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, William Thompson. Uh, Dr. Thompson's research focuses, oh, focuses on temporal uh, network theory, cognitive neuroscience, and ever increasingly within meta science. Currently a postdoc at Karolinska Institute, Stockholm. Uh, regarding meta science, Dr. Thompson's uh, main interests are uh, how scientists do research, both with regard to their communication of results and their hypothesis making. So this talk will be about his concerns regarding a sequential multiple comparison problem for data set reuse. 
we'll um, take away. Okay. First, can you all hear me properly? Yep. Just double checks. Next thing, can you see my screen? Perfect. Yeah. And it's moving. It okay, is well, moving, but I see part of uh, your screen when you move to the next screen. This one. We move to the um, next slide. So is that better? Yep. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Wait, well, thank you all for in, uh, inviting me here. And um, yeah, so two really great talks before me and really great and positive and hopefully I'm not too negative. It's not going to be my intention, uh, but it may sound a bit negative for a bit. Um, so most of the discussion or most of what I'm going to talk about has just uh, relatively recently been published in eLife and my work at... Uh, uh, during my postdoc at Stanford with, in Ross Pordrag's lab. Uh, if you guys want to go into a bit more detail, because some things are going to go maybe a bit quick during this talk. Um, the take home message, I guess, if, uh, from this is that there could be some fiddly consequences of really well intended proposals for improving scientific practices. And maybe we, at times we need to reflect upon how we can best solve any new problems that arise. And the reason why I think this is important is because, I mean, I'm still a relatively young researcher and the amount of diff the amount of change, positive change regarding open science has been immense over the recent years. And it's really important just to make sure that we don't accidentally create some other problem that we have, that we, that, is that when we, um, that it creates a lot of damage by the, when we come around to solve it. So the argument I'm going to put forward, and I'm, basically I'm just going to build an argument within this within these uh, 15 minutes, is that we're using open data, which I'm sometimes going to call sequential analyses. And we, we just heard a lot about how much reusing open data is becoming uh, quite important. And so if we, use, if we reuse open data for statistical inferences or confirmatory studies, uh, this could lead an, to an increase in false positives if it's not done um, if we're not careful. And I just want to note that there are, regardless about this, we, there's a lot of good things we can reuse open data for if everything I say is true as well. So this is, I, I'm totally in for reusing open data, uh, reuse of open data. Uh, I don't want to be um, misunderstood regarding that. But so, so let's just take a step back. I'm talking, I said this was about statistical inference and so what is the point of statistical inference? If we take one step back, and this is kind of like a nice thing when you're all muted, because if I give this talk in person, somebody usually uh, objects to this one sentence. Uh, and I always have to tweak it. But basically, we collect some kind of sample. And then with that sample, we try and infer properties about a larger population. And those properties could be if it's statistically significant, or how confident we are, how credible it is, and so forth. Uh, but we try and we, we're trying to learn something about a wider group or population from a, from some kind of empirical sample, and that's a, that is a generalization. I know there are other things people could argue statistical inference is for, but anyway, within this, especially if you're starting talking about statistically significant types of results, or if you're trying to make some kind of binarization if a result is true or valid, then there's going to be a trade-off between how many false positives we collect we find and how many false negatives we find. And um, and the, the, there are lots of discussions regarding things like base factor and p-values, which are which are supposed to be thresholds to try and to try and uh, kind of set this trade-off level. Okay, so in a traditional empirical analysis, what we do is we get some data, we then analyze the data, we then publish an article with the analysis in there. Okay, but we often do multiple tests per data set. So we get some data and we do multiple tests and then we publish this together uh, in an article and, or, or, or maybe multiple articles. Now, the, and sometimes when you publish multiple results in an article, you're going to do something which is called correcting for multiple comparisons. And what does this mean? Well, because uh, uh, some people may be aware, some people may think this is very obvious, but the more comparisons you do, you, you have a greater chance of, of identifying more false positives. So there are multiple procedures. When you do multiple comparison correction, what you do is you try and restore this trade-off to get to the um, balance of false negatives and false positives that you want. 
uh, because otherwise you're going to have a greater chance of identifying false positives. And there are multiple procedures like Bonferroni correction or false discovery rates. There are two of the popular ones that a lot of people have heard of. So the consequence of no correction, and this is kind of like a really interesting example from uh, Bennett et al. in 2009, they put a dead salmon in an, ML, in an MR camera and scanned the fMRI activity from, the, from this. And there is like uh, several thousands uh, voxels, so small squares, small cubes in the data. And if they didn't do any multiple comparison correction, what they, what they said, what they found was you, you see uh, brain activity in a dead salmon. And this is kind of the consequences of why it's really important to do multiple comparison correction. And this is what, what they were arguing, is we need to do multiple comparison correction because if we as scientists are advocating for brain activity in dead salmon, it seems a bit off. So when we do these multiple comparison corrections, like, well, what comparisons get grouped together? And this is when it gets really, really fiddly in the statistics. And if I had lots of time, I would talk about this for about 40 minutes. Um, but we can consider that we can consider something called error rates, which is this idea of how many false positives uh, do we want? And we can relate that to individual tests. And in, the, in that case, we're not going to be doing any kind of um, multiple comparison correction. And what we will find is this is the kind of case where we're not, where we'll get brain activity, brain activity in a dead salmon. So a lot of people advocate this is not what we should be doing. And other people have advocated uh, back in the 50s, I think it was, um, some people said that the entire experiment should be corrected for. So every single variable you correct for, you should co do some kind of multiple comparison correction for all possible uh, statistical tests you do. And most people feel that's too extreme. And generally, it's um, considered to be somewhere in between. And some, some people will argue it's actually very close over to this side of the spectrum, some people over here, and maybe some people over here. I'm probably going to present a, an argument why it's, um, that's supposed to be an arrow, uh, why it's tending more in this direction. I'm not going to provide a uh, definition of what a um, statistical family is, but it's supposed to be a set of related tests. And it's somewhere in here, and it's a big debate in, um, in the statistical literature if you dive into it. And generally, uh, here's some consensus definitions you sometimes find. The, it usually gets divided up into two different groups where it's considered the same family if you're doing data dredging. And data dredging is sometimes called exploratory analyses or ex when you're doing explore statistical infer inference with exploratory analyses. And so, so if you're doing exploratory analyses, then you'll do, then you should, then it's all considered part of the same family. If you're just correlating anything with anything without any hy hypothesis. Uh, the second group is if you're doing confirmatory analysis and it's a similar research question. And this is also a bit vague and you can have this definition and put yourself anywhere on this spectrum still. But what I want to kind of take out of that is regardless of what the definition of family is, the next argument I'm going to tell you about open data holds. So it doesn't matter what the definition of family is, but uh, we still need to know that there is a thing called a family. So now I'll get back to where we were. That was a long side note. Now I'm going back to these nice, uh, pretty uh, iconic figures and not going to stop talking about uh, statistical families for a teeny bit. So this is what I showed you before. We have data, we have analyses, we have uh, one person um, presenting these two. And let's now imagine these are the same statistical family and they're correcting for the, these two comparisons in this article, which is what you often see. Now let's consider this new scenario when data are open. Um, so we've got data, we analyze the data and this article is published. And secondly, uh, this data also now goes on a server that we've heard about just now with, with a data descriptor and all this. Somebody else analyzes this data and publishes a second, this second comparison. And before these were considered part of the same statistical family. So is there anything now that has made these different statistical families due to this? So if we're going to look at this, we need to see, well, what is different between these two scenarios? And there are only two real main differences between these two scenarios. One is the timing of the test. These two are done simultaneously in one paper. And in the, this case, they're done separately. There's a, there's a time lag between them. And the second is who does the test? So here I've written, there's one, uh, an author up here called Ashley, and here I've got Ashley and Blake because uh, yeah, so, so somebody else has downloaded to reuse this, this, this data that's on a server. So these are the two big differences. 
And if these are considered the same statistical family in this one case, one of these two things must be sufficient to create a new statistical family if, um, if, this, if, this is, if you don't need to correct in this instance. And if, you're, if, you're, if, you are, if they are the same statistical family and there is no correction, then we're going to be increasing in false positives. That's kind of the point, the point of this argument. So I'm going to now do something called reductio ad absurdum where I'm going to assume this is true and show that's absurd. And I'm gonna assume this is true to create new statistical families and I'll show that's absurd as well. So if time creates a new statistical family, a, a genuine way we could correct for multiple comparisons is just wait the X number of days needed to make a new statistical family. So if I get that, uh, if I scan a dead salmon, um, all I need to do is, is analyze one voxel, wait X number of days, analyze the next voxel. Eventually I will say I've, um, I can present statistically significant results showing brain activity in a dead salmon that I've corrected by waiting. And this sounds absurd, and that means this can't create a new family. Second, if the person matters, well, we can think of a similar scenario, is that instead of waiting the number of times, all I need to do is get more people to analyze each voxel. So I can go on to a, a crowdsourcing site like Mechanical Turk or any of those, and uh, get, uh, get one person to analyze a voxel. I then collect all this information, present the results, and say I've corrected for these... Um, so if I do it for the dead salmon, I can say, I've got statistically significant brain activity in a dead salmon. I've corrected for the multiple comparisons by, um, by, uh, um, by crowdsourcing. And both of these don't seem to be a good way of correcting for multiple comparisons. So the kind of the argument's conclusion is that there's nothing about the sequentialness of sequential analyses that generates new statistical families. So that, but if you're arguing for very small families, this may not be a problem. But if you're arguing for bigger families, then this can become a problem if we're reusing data a lot. So I'm going to try and talk briefly about if, if this, how much this is a problem. So let's imagine now, so this is on some empirical data that we use from the Human Connectome Project. And let's just imagine that one group uh, did 182 simultaneous analyses. So they did them all in one, in one paper. And let's imagine 182 different groups did one analysis and they left that uncorrected. And the, 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 there were 68 variables involved that we corrected for in, 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 in each, um, in each uh, analysis here. But there's, so there's 182 analysis here and one analysis here. Uh, ignore the bottom part of this figure. It's only the top part we need to care about. Uh, this is the rest, some other part of the paper. Um, in the green ones at the top here, these, if we correct uh, the number of, this is the number of findings we got if we corrected for all the analyses, all these 182 times 68 uh, variables in this analysis, we did them all at once, we will get two statistically significant findings. If we uh, did 182 different groups that reuse this data, we got considerably more. Uh, so, so over 30 or over 40, depending on how you're correcting within the study. So this shows that you can get a lot more, um, a lot more, uh, and these, these have a higher chance, a much higher chance of being false positives because we are allowing, uh, because, because that, um, that about that trade-off I was talking about between false positives and false negatives is now biasing or going more and more towards false positives or identify more false positives. So is this a problem? So I'm gonna talk a bit more uh, how this could be a problem um, in the last couple of minutes before I get to the solutions. So surprisingly, and this is kind of like a really interesting part of this is that when we kind of integrate the solution with other solutions people have proposed to science. So there's um, a lot of people want to find differences between confirmatory analyses and exploratory analyses. The most famous one is probably uh, Wagemarkers et al. in 2012 that uh, argued that pre-registration before the experiment is what makes something, is, is how we can know something is confirmatory. The rationale of this is that this is the only way for the scientific community to be sure it is confirmatory because otherwise people could be doing exploratory things and masking it as confirmatory. 
So that's why the pre-registration is necessary to demarcate the difference between confirmatory and exploratory work. But if we accept this, so if we accept this, and this is where it kind of gets interesting, then reusing unrestricted open data has to be considered exploratory. And this means it's a very big family. And why, why do I say this? Well, if, if it's unrestricted open data, then we don't know when the other people, when, when the researchers actually downloaded it. So even if they pre-registered their, their, their analysis, this becomes slightly problematic because we don't know if the pre-registration was after they obtained the data. So we're back to this entire problem about what the point about, um, that we don't know if the analysis is being masked as confirmatory. So the entire point of the pre-registration to differentiate this gets lost if we're doing um, confirmatory analyses on uh, unrestricted open data. And restricting the open data, I do not think is a good solution to this. And uh, yeah, I could discuss this a lot more, but kind of wrapping up now before I get to some maybe positives. Uh, what I'm just trying to do is this illustrates how new challenges and maybe un, um, unexpected challenges can arise from well-intended solutions and both the, like open data reuse really good uh, and the confirmatory exploratory dis dis uh, demarcation extremely good. And open data has many uses and I'm, this is not an argumentation against any type of open data but we should be aware that it's not always a free lunch. Like oh, just because things are open does not mean it's uh, endless benefits. And this also means that we're not going to get like some kind of ultimate data set. Data collection never stops. We always have to collect more data. And so the, so the main point of here is the reuse of, in, um, of open data entails what's eventually going to decay in the amount we can actually do these statistical inferences and confirmatory analyses because we may have to correct for how many times we do it. So let's just mention a couple of solutions to this problem. How, how can we go from here? One interesting thing we can do is think about how, how can we get around this problem with pre-registrations and confirmatory analyses? So we heard a bit uh, in the last talk, uh, a really good talk about uh, data descriptors uh, on scientific data and so forth. Uh, so one thing that we could actually do is maybe if we publish these data descriptors, we actually have a grace period where people can pre-register the results before the data is released. And by doing this, we, we, we make sure that this demarcation between confirmatory and exploratory uh, research is at least maintained for that grace period. We can be sure that everything that uh, is pre-registered in that grace period before the data is kind of made fully open, but we've got a description of the data to be able to write the pre-registration, that in some way could be a, a partial solution to mitigate the problem. But as soon as the data is released, then we have the problem, the problems back. There's, there's like, we could maybe try and do better sequential correction um, to try and get around this as well. This is more discussed in the paper. Or we can justify our families a bit more. We can maybe motivate why our family, statistical families should be very small. That's a way, a way to get around it as well, if necessary. Uh, something which you see a lot in machine learning is held out data on data repositories. So something that the researchers don't have access to. But in many fields, for example, in neuroimaging, where I am a, a, a lot of the time is we have very small data sets. So this is quite hard to do, to have held out data. But if we have held out data, there are some really interesting things in machine learning to try and get reusable test data. Uh, and there's some really, really interesting paper. Uh, and if you're interested in this, I really recommend checking out this science paper, which is uh, really good. And another interesting thing is, is maybe the, the use, the reuse of open data can be exploratory. And we don't have to do statistical inferences on exploratory work. We can just be happy that we, we're, we're trying to understand the data, not generalize to an entire population. And maybe that's what open data should be reused for, is to make better hypotheses that we can then do other confirmatory analysis on when we collect more data and release that as well. So there is a lot of use for open data. And maybe it, we should just embrace exploratory analysis a bit more. And I quite like this, this one. So this was my take home message that we've got, I, I'm hopefully I've tried to convince you that these, with this one specific example, we can sometimes get these fiddly consequences and uh, from really well-intended proposals. And we should reflect sometimes, not always, but sometimes take a step back and reflect on how we can best solve these new problems before, before they become substantial problems. 
So thank you for listening and thank you to the co-authors co of this paper and the uh, Knut and Alice Valenbe Stiftelse for financing my, my research. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, William. So this is fascinating work. It's uh, really mind blowing to uh, think about while we're talking about data reuse, um, you know, like as many great things, um, it's a double edged sword. So um, yeah, for the sake of time, I guess I don't see any immediate questions um, coming in. So uh, now I would like to invite all speakers um, back to the spotlight. Um, then we'll have um, questions um, for all three of you. So any questions for um, any of the speakers, all, all of them? So feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. So I think I've seen uh, from a previous session um, there's a question for, uh, was for Varsha, but maybe all of you uh, is relevant for all of you. Um, is regard so is it by Lorraine? Do you want to uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself? Lauren? Sure. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question was about peer review for data sets. Um, I've heard a lot of talk about how difficult it is to find peer reviewers for data sets. So Varsha, you were talking about this specifically. I just wondered uh, how your experience has been with that. Uh, has it been, uh, what has written your approach to find peer reviewers for data sets and maybe for everybody else? Uh, do you have any guidance, best practices, wish lists for peer review of data sets uh, that you can share with everybody? Thank you. So um, our experience is um, obviously it's in it's in relation to a manuscript that we're asking people to look at the data set. So that's the first thing just to bear that in mind. It's not we're asking people to look at the data set independently of the manuscript. So I would say it fits in the kind of known workflow of, of reviewing a manuscript. Um, what we do is those questions that I shared are the questions that we actually include in our in the um, reviewer form or the reviewer guidance form at scientific data so we're guiding our reviewers to look at the data set um we can't make anyone look at the data set so i would just say that as well and, and sometimes we get reviews back and it's very clear that the reviewer has not looked at the data set and i think that's where that's where my team comes in i guess with the team of uh, curators so the work we do on a manuscript is actually takes place after the paper has been accepted after the peer review process was completed um and so that's when we're doing some of these checkings, checks and, and, and establishing that the data are actually matching uh, what's written in the manuscript, making sure that the links are actually to the correct data set. And there have been instances where we have found just, you know, people are human, they make errors, it's natural, but we're trying to uh, read out as many of those errors before the, the paper is published so that it is as accurate as possible at the point it's published. Um, the other thing I would say this year has been really interesting um, and difficult for uh, journals um, in the sense that we've had such an influx and such an increase of submissions, all mostly to, due to the COVID situation. And so it's been increasingly difficult to find peer review. So that has been a thing. And I'm sure you'll all have noticed if you are submitting papers, the peer review times have just gotten longer and longer. So generally, it is getting harder to find people to peer review manuscripts full stop. So next I think question is comment, I've never yeah. been asked to review a data set, but just about that last comment, I have never said no to so many review requests as I have in the last like month and a half. Yeah, <laughs> difficult times. <laughs> so we have a next, next question is from uh, Amit. Hey, uh, um, hey, this is Amit from Material Science Department. I'm doing my postdoc here at Carnegie Mellon. My question is for William. First of all, excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. The way you projected the uh, the dead settlement and how it can lead to so many problems and sort of problems, especially we see in smaller data sets. So what I'm trying to get at is like, are you suggesting that more metadata is needed as the amount of data is increasing? 
to handle false positives. Because indefinitely in small data sets, if we keep redoing the analysis, we are getting into this trap. But yesterday, I, uh, we have this whole discussion, whole day. And one of the comment came out yesterday was from Marshall Hebert, is that large amount of data basically balances out the errors. So, but in the domain like material science, maybe in the domain you are working where we don't have large data sets, we have this problem. But in the domain, something where we have millions of images, maybe we don't have any thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting question. I, I would definitely say a lot of my talk is definitely biased towards the smaller data set research of, for example, neuroimaging, where we are most likely underpowered in a lot of studies. And it, this is, I don't think it's unique to neuroimaging. I think there are several fields where it's like this, where it's very costly to, to acquire lots of data. And uh, there's also a lot of research degrees of freedom that can go into analyzing the data sets. In other fields, as far as I understand, there's a lot more streamlined analysis pipelines. So even in the pipelines, there's less degrees of freedom. And that means there's less chance of, it's basically if you have, a, so I, I guess you all know if there's a hundred, um, what is that, a thousand monkeys on a thousand typewriters, eventually one of them will write Macbeth or something like that. If we have a thousand doctoral students working on a thousand data, uh, working on the same data set with a thousand degrees of freedom, they're going to get statistically significant results eventually. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be less the case with, uh, w with larger data sets, obviously, because they're, that's just that's just going to be the case. So I agree with you. It's less of a problem with in larger data sets. I, I sorry. I, I think I've waffled a bit. Have I uh, answered your question? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I'll mute myself. Uh, next, uh, Alex has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Sure. Yeah. So um, I actually spent some time. Uh, last year reviewing the data sharing um, policies of various journals. And so at Springer Nature of those four levels, only level four actually requires data sharing of all of the authors. Policy levels two and three just require sharing for specific types of data like sequencing or molecular structure data. And policy level one doesn't require anything, not even a statement of data availability. Um, so Springer Nature only has seven journals I counted that have adopted a level four policy and um, casually checking one of them, um, it actually is using the level three policy requirement language. <laughs> so there's virtually no uh, Springer Nature journals that are requiring data sharing from most researchers, uh, even heavyweights like Nature, which could presumably ask its authors to do just about anything to publish, are not requiring it. So why is that? Why are the journals so reluctant to make this a requirement? So, um... I think uh, one thing to uh, bear in mind is that, uh, so when I, I, I've been at Springer Nature just over six years. When I started, we were the kind of black sheep of the family. We were sitting in a corner and we were doing something weird about research data. And no, none of the rest of the business really knew what we were doing, but they kind of tolerated us is how I think of it. And we've managed in the last six years, we've moved from a point where that was the case to where research data is front and center. And it's a culture change as much as it is a culture change for researchers to get to the point where they feel comfortable to share the data it's also also a culture change for journals and for editors to get to the point where they're requiring researchers to share data and so um the idea of the policy levels is to make kind of a stepwise access uh, take step take people through the um the research data sharing journey in a stepwise way so that each step becomes a little bit easier. Okay, you've got a level two policy. Could you move it to level three? What's the next step that you would need to do? Um, I totally agree with you that there is a big difference between level three and level four as it is currently written and implemented. Um, I would say it's a work in progress. So we're in this uh, new world together and we are working towards a situation where we can move towards uh, increasing the level of data sharing. Um, I don't know if people on the call are familiar with um, an organisation called the Research Data Alliance, but it's basically bringing together people that are interested in research data um, from all different stakeholder groups 
And as part of that work, there's actually a, um, there's actually a, a group there working to create um, a cross-publisher journal level, leveling policy level, which uh, once that's been agreed, the idea is that then each of the different publishers will then use that same um, policy leveling. Um, and so we're kind of, it, it doesn't make sense for us to rejig our policy level when we are involved in this other work. And once that's been finalized, the intention is we will then implement that more stepwise level. So to make it easier for um, journals to go from one level to the next. Um, we are working hard with our editors, with our journals to move them across to the point where we can really embed uh, data sharing into everything that we do. But um, it takes time, unfortunately, it takes time. I think that RDA working group just, just published the, um, their finalized recommendations like last month. Yeah, absolutely. And my colleague, um, Rebecca Grant, uh, she's, she's one of the co-chairs of that group. And so um, her, her work, her, uh, her um, role in the company, it, one of her roles in the company is to implement that policy. So but as I say, all of these things take time. It's not like, you know, the idea can publish it and then next week we'll have that implemented. It does take time. Interesting. Thank you. William and Al, do you have something to add? Okay, <laughs> all right, so I see a hand from uh, Ali. Hi, yeah, um, so it's okay if uh, William and Al didn't comment on this uh, previous question because this one's a bit more for them. So it was mentioned that there was a question yesterday about uh, sort of error propagation. That was me, uh, guilty as charged. I was trying to um, express a, a concern or at least just a, a question about the larger idea of modeling on models. So, you know, I take uh, the issue that William has raised very seriously. It's similar to a conversation I had with a statistician uh, at science a couple years ago. And basically, as far as the interaction between open science and these AI ML tools, which we talked about a lot yesterday, I guess my concern was every time we take a step away from the real data that was originally collected on the ground, I'm concerned that what we may do is instead of having our models built on, say, to use the air quality research, instead of having all of the models based on the ramp data, then there's some kind of a composite formed from that. And then the next AI ML tool is actually built on the composite rather than going back to that original ramp data. And then we build composites and composites on composites. And I, I look at it really as a philosophy of science question where we have to understand what these models are doing. And too often, unfortunately, we, we don't seem to. Um, so you know, today, of course, is more open science and open data focus. So if anybody has a comment on you know, what we could do either at the philosophy of science level or at the data usage level, since I am a librarian and I'm concerned with, uh, you know, repositories and, and making data reusable and useful, how can we guard against this? So I, I, I agree with, with what you're saying there. I mean, definitely in sort of the there's a whole community of people doing these low cost air pollutant sensors. And one of the big topics of discussion is sort of openness and transparency and how we're doing the calibrations. Cause like, for instance, some of our calibrations are nonlinear um, and, you know, people might naively assume that they're linear and can just be applied anywhere. And, you know, if they're not, then, you know, you're taking this sort of number and, and putting it out of context, both in sort of time and space. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, I, I'm, I don't necessarily have any, answers, but I, you know, it is something that, that is an active discussion in the, in the community. And I guess I can add to that. And I, I think it's an excellent point you brought up. And I agree completely with that as well. And uh, I, I guess all I can do is I, I can suggest when you talk about philosophy of science and so forth, one way I see it is, so I work a lot with uh, network models and there we create an abstraction from the concrete to the network. And when we do that, uh, when people then start analyzing the network, there's two ways you can go. You can go more and more abstract away from the concrete phenomena, or you can analyze a network in a way which is interpretable of the phenomena you're analyzing. And 
I'm not entirely sure if this is to do with how much this is to do with open practices, but it's more to do with best practices of how to analyze empirical phenomena. Uh, but it's an excellent point. And I, I, I'm happy to talk about it as well. Awesome, sounds good, thank you. So we have a next question from Keith. Keith, please go ahead and answer Okay, yourself. thanks. I, I won't be too long because you'll hear from me later in the day. I'm Keith Webster at Carnegie Mellon. I wanted to ask predictably for a Scott about the um, costs and infrastructure aspects of this. And maybe I could pose a question to Varsha and then a second question on the same theme to Alan William. So the, the first question is about the costs of sharing or publishing data in Springer scientific data. I know that you charge a, a transactional fee and I'm wondering what that buys in the sense of long-term accessibility. Is this a, I pay my $2,000 and you will look after my data and make it available forever and ever. Who knows what that might mean. Um, and then secondly, to our research colleagues, what are your expectations of long-term access to your data? And whose responsibility do you think it is to cover the costs for that? Is it your institution? Is it a publisher? Is it your research funder? Should this be a common good that some intergovernmental organization should pay for? Thank you for the question. So uh, to be clear, scientific data is a journal and not a data repository. And that's something that has been um, very clear with scientific data particularly from the start. We don't, scientific data works with, um, has some integrations with like FigChef, for example, for data sets that can't go anywhere else. But we are, we've, scientific data has always maintained that community-based repositories are the best location for data. We don't want to see sequence data in FigChef. We don't want to see um, data that could be hosted in the, you know, excellent repository of Pangea in Figshare. And so what we're trying to do where we can is support the use of those community repositories. Um, but there are no, not all communities have repositories, not all disciplines have good repositories. And so therefore we have um, collaborations with Dryad, with Figshare, other generalist repositories that um, authors are very welcome to use. Um, so the APC doesn't cover anything um, to do with the storage of the data unless they're using the integrated FigShare, in which case um, it's stand subject to the standard FigShare um, preservation. I think it's something like 20 odd years after it's been, after the data set's been published, something like that. Um, publishers are um, well versed in long-term preservation. That's what we do in terms of the scientific record with those articles. So even if a journal uh, fold, the, the articles will remain accessible. And so we're trying to think, of, uh, work with repositories to get them to a, a similar point. Um, if I can answer your next question, I, I personally don't think that we will, in a few years time, be able to preserve all of the data that's ever been produced. We are going to have to start making decisions about what we keep. Okay, so we have a um, yeah we have a one uh, this is probably the last question from Brian. Um, sure, thank you guys all for talking about these topics. This is actually kind of uh, a this is related to a question that I asked at Open Science Symposium like two or three years ago, but um, to address some of the issues with um, sort of data accumulation and also data reuse and the statistical um, sort of legitimacy of reuse, should data sets just sort of be replenish uh, with fresh data? So even things that we think we know about data, data sets on, you know, things that come to mind are sort of like uh, genomic databases where it's the, the formatting of the data is much more formalized and data reuse is really common. Um, should everything just basically be expected to be uh, reasserted at some point, sort of like an expiration date? I, I guess I can start answering that. Um, great question. And 
I think in all use cases, it, it, I think in a lot of different contexts, there's going to be a different answer to that question, unfortunately, if you were hoping for one general thing. But, and it also depends on how you intend to use the data. So for example, in a lot of instances where you're maybe fitting a model to some training data and want to use some, some data to validate the model, then always adding data to that data set is going to be very useful because the new data can then be, can be the new test data. And that was a great way to, to prevent kind of overfitting to occur in machine learning or something like that. So, but uh, in other cases, so for example, psycho, so in the field I generally work in psychology, neuroscience and stuff like that, we, we, we do experimental settings where it's going to be hard if we have a hundred people to do one experiment, it's going to be hard to add to that experiment com uh, continuously for, for ad infinitum. We're going to have to say stop at some point uh, because we're going to want to do different experiments or and so forth. In those instances, the important thing is to make sure we replicate studies or, or, so, we, so, we, so we know if the results that we have from previous experiments are valid or not. Uh, and then we at least we get two data sets instead of one data set. And I, then I think that's also very useful where we get multiple data sets doing a similar thing. So hopefully I answered your question. Again, I think I sneered, uh, uh, waffled a bit, but Just hopefully that was a good enough answer. And to add a perspective from you know a different field, and I think this answers Keith's question about what makes forever. I mean, since we're doing real world measurements and the real world is always changing for policy reasons and, and other reasons, you know, 10 years is pretty darn old. Anything older than 15 years is, is pretty obsolete. And so to me, forever is approximately 15 years, you know? Um, and so if we overwrite things every 10 or 15 years, that's well, or if we append, you know, generate a new data set every 10 or 15 years, that's totally reasonable. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, all the panelists. Your talks are so, uh, so great. And thanks, audience, for the great discussion. So I encourage, like, there's obviously a lot of uh, to talk about. I encourage you to take the discussion further in the Slack and in Gather Town. So we're going to take a 15 minutes break, and we'll be back on time at 1145. Thank you all.